question I wanted to ask you guys today is, have you ever had an enemy? <laughs> is there someone like in your life that just desires to ruin it? <laughs> Wow, siblings looking at each other very nice. <laughs> Does anyone ever, like, is there someone in your life that, like, it just seems like they're out to get you? Anybody? Anybody? Anyone have that, 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 that issue ever with, like, a sp particular individual that, for whatever reason, has become your mortal enemy? Is this just something that's in comic books? I don't know. <laughs> no one? No one has any enemies? Personally, for me, like, I've never really, I don't know, I guess I was a likable kid. I don't know what it was. Um, I only got in one fight. Yeah, you got some people that get in a lot of fights. You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> um, for, for me, I got in one fight, and it was actually the last day before I was leaving my school. It's kind of weird timing. Um, and I went to a, a Baptist private school. Okay, so it was like this goody two shoes. We wore all these uniforms. I had to wear this Oxford white shirt with green slacks. I hated it. Um, and, and the last day I had, I was actually moving to a, a different part, you know, in a different state or you no, know, same state, different city, right? I, I was leaving the school, and I don't know. Like there was like this kid. His name was Shane. This fat kid. And uh, for some reason, he just decided to pick on me on my last day. I have no idea what triggered this. Um, I would never say that we were never, like, I, I didn't ever think of him as an enemy, but for whatever reason, there was this conflict on the last day of school. And so, um, like, he was trying to fight me, but, like, it's like he didn't know how to fight. And so he was just kind of, like, flailing aimlessly. Like, I was, like, here, and he was, like, kicking in this direction. I'm like, what is this guy doing? And then I, I was actually trained in Taekwondo, right? Um, I th what belt was I back then? I was probably somewhere in the middle, maybe like a green belt or something like that. <laughs> and so I just side kicked him in the stomach and he like went down. <laughs> and I said, like, what was that? And then like later on that day, like this is like much later, he comes and he starts like trying to kick me again and he's like hitting me. And I'm just like sitting there like, like, like he's doing nothing, I'm playing it cool. Um, anyway, that was the one quote unquote fight I ever had. Um, this was my last day, this was sixth grade. Um, and, and I was about to leave that school, and so it's a weird thing. But regardless, I don't really call him my enemy. I don't know whatever happened to him. Um, Shane, that kid. Anyway, um, so we're going to be introduced to the enemy of the story, the uh, antagonist, if you will. So Esther 3, um, open up your Bible, smartphones, or go ahead and look at the screen. Esther 3, starting from verse 1, where the Lord says this. After these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of uh, Hamadatha, the uh, Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all the other nobles. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, Why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day, they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore, they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated, for he had told them he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. In the twelfth year of King Xerxes, in the first month, the month of Nisan, the Pur, that is the Lot, was cast in the presence of Haman to select a day and month. And the Lot fell on the twelfth month, the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, There is a certain people dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of all other peoples, and they do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be, be issued to destroy them, and I will give 10,000 talents of silver to the king's administrators for the royal treasury. So the king took his signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, son of Hamad, uh, Hamadatha, uh, Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews, Keep the money, the king said to Haman, and do with the people as you please. 
that on the 13th day of the first month, the, the royal secretaries were summoned. They wrote out in the script of each province and in the language of each people all Haman's orders to the king's satraps, the governors of the various uh, provinces, and the nobles of the various peoples. These were written in the name of King Xerxes himself and sealed with his own ring. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so that they would be ready for that day. The couriers went out, spurred on by the king's command, and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. Father, we thank you and we praise you, and we just pray, Lord, that you would speak to us today, that, that in this crisis that, that fell on the Jews, your people, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that, that you would speak to us, Lord, your heart, and Lord, that, that, that we wouldn't be um, in any way, Lord, feeling, Lord, that, that we are under that type of oppression, that type of insurmountable enemy, but that we would know that you alone our God, that you alone can rescue, you alone can save. Help us to know this, to trust this, and to live accordingly. We thank you, and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So again, um, we're continuing in this, uh, this, this, you know, theme of, of, of being transformers, knowing that the gospel is transforming us, and understanding that God desires us to be agents of change as well. Before I get into this, um, I meant to start off with this, but uh, yeah, a, a kind of interesting thing happened to me this week. Now, for whatever reason, for the past like month or so, there are two things people keep telling me, and you know, I, like I guess for a while I didn't really understand. The first thing is people keep telling me like, "Look like you lost weight," and I'm like, "No, what are you talking about? I'm wearing black. Come on, like, and like you know, <laughs> like, like I'll say it's an optical illusion." And so people keep telling me this, and it's been like a series of people. Um, I have been exercising a little bit more, like more than zero. Um, <laughs> But I don't know. I don't know if I trust that just yet. But people have been saying that. The other thing people have been saying is they're like, hey, like news, like it seems like it's growing. And um, I was like, ah, whatever. And actually, the first person to notice this was the head pastor of our main church. In the middle of one of our meetings, all of a sudden he's like, give us a report. And I'm like, what? And, and I was like, oh, and I, I, I didn't know it. So, what was he supposed to do? And so I just like said whatever. And then he's like, he was start, he started asking me about our numbers, and I was like, ah, you know, like it's the same, probably around 30 or so. And, and then he seemed kind of disappointed. And so I started looking at the numbers, and I saw that there had been an increase. And, I was like, and so I told him afterwards, I said, oh, like, I guess I was wrong. And he's like, yeah, I pay attention to those numbers. Like, oh. um, but to, like, actually, the reason why this comes to note is because this week I've been preparing a report to give to our pastors. And so every, um, every six months we have a, a pastoral staff meeting where we all get together and every single department reports, right? And so I've been putting this report together. So, you know, I'm an engineer, right? I enjoy numbers. And so, I, you know, I have all the attendance numbers and I put them up. And I was comparing the first six months of this year to the six, first six months of last year. And I was like, whoa, like as an engineer, this is statistically significant. Um, basically, our average last year was about little under 30, right? But we had a very large standard deviation. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm talking statistically. It was a standard deviation of about 8, something like that, pretty high. So that means that there were huge spikes, right? Right now, just this past six months, our, 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 our average, our mean, is about 45. And, um, and the standard deviation is only around 4. So that, that means that it's, it's, it's a higher average, but it's a very tight window. It only goes from like 40 to 50, right? And so I was like, how did this happen? Like, what's going on? Like, so to me, it's just, I was very confused because the numbers do not lie. At the same time, I'm not saying like, like oh, news revival, blah, 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 praise God. No, like, there are great things going on here. And let me, let me just say that, that I don't want to take away from that. Um, I'll say for myself personally, now what happened was Wednesday night, as I was preparing these reports, I kind of got like angry at my other department. I have two departments that I'm in charge of, right? The other department, 
I never go because they meet during our time. So I have no idea what they're doing. And, and so like, I needed to get information from them, but they were just, they kept passing me around. They're like, oh, ask this in the, like this person, ask this person. Like, they kept passing me around. I was like, how come nobody knows anything? I was getting really pissed off at them. Um, probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, I was getting really angry, and I went, like, I tried to go to sleep angry, right? And I couldn't sleep. I was like, it was like, it wasn't bad insomnia, but I just, I was just lying in bed. At first, a mosquito was there, and so I had to kill the mosquito. I killed the mosquito, so I should have been able to fall asleep from that point, but I just couldn't sleep. I was like, what's going on? And so I just felt like, okay, you know, if I can't sleep, I'll just start working on the report. And that's when I started to work on the report. That's when I started to see the numbers. And, and I think God was really speaking to me. God was just like, you know what? You came into this year kind of down. And personally, it was, it was hard going into this year. The reason why is because for myself, I tend to, like when, when, when there are people like that I really develop a close relationship that I really bond with, when they, when they have to go, it's hard for me to let that go, right? And personally, just the past couple of years, like my cousin was one of the first that needed to leave. You know, he's a missionary in Palestine now. Um, like Sam and Audrey, they left last year, and so it was like it was hard for me to see people like that go, just because like I felt like they were like like comrades, compatriots, right? And so like I, I felt like my heart was still with them, that I was not really noticing what was going on in the ministry. And so I think God was really trying to remind me, He's like, you came into this year thinking that you had lost all this support and that you were on your own, but the reality is so far from that. He said, like, I've been supporting you this whole time. And I've been encouraging you and blessing you this whole time, and you've been blind to me. And so I was like, wow, like, I'm stupid. What's wrong with me? And so like, I, honestly, that, this was like 5 a.m., and I'm just like, like, like getting this like, new perspective. And funny thing is, like, I just peeked on Facebook. I saw Daniel was still up. <laughs> He's like posting stuff about Busan. <laughs> and like, what's this guy still doing up? <laughs> and so uh, I'm seeing all these things, and then like, I kind of pass out. Like, I don't know what happens. I, I kind of black out. And then I get a phone call, and it's like, that cheap something that I got angry at, that I went to sleep angry on. And he was like apologizing and all that stuff. I felt like terrible and all that stuff. And, and I don't know. It's just, it was a weird thing. But you'll see later on in the story that God uses insomnia to bring people to remembrance. Now, I'm not saying every case of insomnia that you have is God. <laughs> there are physical, mental, and a lot of like things going on that cause insomnia. I'm not saying it's always God. But I don't know. I just had one of those moments where I think God was speaking to me by not letting me sleep. Um, so I just wanted to share that. Um, it's been a, an encouragement to me, and you know, if it's an encouragement to you, I hope um, that that's what you'll take from that. But regardless, Transformers. That's our theme for the year. We are going through Esther. Last week we saw that in chapter one. Uh, we're introduced to all of our characters, right? There's King Xerxes. King Xerxes is the most powerful man in the world at this point in history. Most powerful man. And the way he uses his power, the way he uses his wealth, he throws a six-month party, right? Not the smartest thing. And then after six months, he has a seven, uh, like he has a one-week, like everyone get drunk party, right? And at that peak of that of his drunkenness, he's like, "Come get my wife." And it, it kind of seems like he was being inappropriate in that he wanted his wife to come out naked with just the crown on her head, regardless of whether it was inappropriate or not. She says no. And instead of, of his triumph and joy, you see brokenness and emptiness. So much so that in his rage, he, he issues an edict banishing his wife, kicking out Queen Vashti. And the thing with Persian law was once you write a law, it's set forever. The king cannot change the law. And so you see in chapter 2, he wakes up and he's like, what did I do? I just kicked out my queen. And then you see this beauty pageant, and you're introduced to these, these new characters, these, these immigrant Jews, Mordecai and Esther. And all of a sudden, this little orphan girl is transformed, becomes the most beautiful uh, woman in the city. He marries her, and you see that God is using these people, these forgotten people, these people that didn't go back to Israel, that stayed in Persia. He's using them to instill hope into a story that starts off very somber. Now in chapter 3, now there's a problem, right? Chapter 2 ended with Mordecai. Mordecai, he's just kind of around. I still don't know what his job is. It just seems like he's homeless, and he's just kind of sitting around listening to everybody. And he overhears that these people want to kill King Xerxes. So he tells them, 
and nothing happens. Like they stop the assassination, but Mordecai is not rewarded. And so what you are shown at the end of chapter two, going into chapter three, is that the the writer is trying to tell you, you know what? The king should have trusted Mordecai, but instead he chose this this guy named Haman. Right? And we'll start to understand who is this man Haman. Now when you read this chapter right away these are the three questions that came to my head okay just just the surface reading i just read it and i'm like what's wrong with mordecai everybody else is bowing down like you know it's just like can you inside like, like is it that big of a deal and like you know here's mordecai like, like he's like refusing to do anything to honor this guy Haman. i'm like why is he so like what's what's his problem and then Haman, when he finds out you know of course you would expect him to be upset but he kind of goes too far, right? He's like, you know what? I don't want to just punish him. I don't want to just kill him. I want to kill every single Jew in the universe. Right? And he goes all the way to this extreme. And then Xerxes, here, here's the thing, is it's not Haman's choice. Haman has been given power, but at the end of the day, Xerxes is the one that has to okay it. And so you have this king that has every chance to stop this madness. Right? This guy who has this crazy plan, he could have just been like, what's wrong with you, man? He just didn't bow to you. Calm down. <laughs> but instead, he just said, okay. So at the end of the day, like last, last week I talked about how I had sympathy for Xerxes. It's lonely to be in that type of power. It's lonely to be like the, the, most, you know, the, the most powerful ruler of the greatest empire in that point in history. Right? I felt bad for him. He kind of acted stupidly and he's regretting in chapter 2. Chapter 3... I don't like him anymore. Because so I'm like, bro, you put this, this very weird guy in charge, and then you don't stop him from his foolishness. So these are the three questions that came to mind right away when I read this passage. Now let me unpack some of this, because really right away, the word that sticks out that makes this make more sense is this word agagite. Right? Agagite. Go ahead and say it for me. Agagite. <laughs> it's fun to say agagite. <laughs> so what, what is an agagite, right? Anyone have any idea who Agag is? Oh, we got a good good should Bible be, reader. Should it annihilate by sound? All right. Our Pujanjib son knows what he's talking about. Okay, so <laughs> King Agag. He was the king of the Amalekites. And so if you look back in the story, back in 1 Samuel 15, King Saul is given this job. King Saul is given the job to eliminate all of the Amalekites. And the Amalekites, and, and, and basically Saul is able to conquer them, but you have to understand that when, when God gave them instructions, you had to follow them exactly. Their instructions were to kill not just the men, all women, children, livestock, anything that had any scent of Amalekite to it. Right? They weren't supposed to take any treasure for themselves. They were supposed to destroy everything. But what does Saul do? Saul spares the king, and then he takes the best of the sheep, the best of the horses, and like just takes it for himself. Why was that a problem? This was a problem because when God was, was giving these types of instructions, God wasn't telling the Jews to be like, hey, you know what? It's your job to conquer this kingdom and to loot it. When God was giving instructions, he says, he, what he was telling them is, you are my instrument of judgment. I have pronounced judgment on these people for their sins, and it is your job to completely wipe them out. This is not for your benefit. This is for justice. And what Saul does is, Saul chooses to be a worldly king. What do I mean by that? He, what, what I mean by that is, what, what kings would often do, when they conquered another king, they would let the other king stay alive, and they would keep them in their prison, like kind of a zoo. And so they would have like, like you know, this jail full of former kings that they would kind of show off to their friends. Like, hey guys, check this out. And like, hey, look at this king. Uh -huh. And like, you know, they, they would basically just parade them around, right, to show their power. That was a common practice at the time, and that's what Saul was doing. He was sparing King Agag because he wanted to treat him as a pet to show off to anybody else. And then he was taking the best for himself. Right? But then when, when Samuel comes, Samuel the prophet shows up and he's like, look, you didn't finish the job. What's wrong with you? And that's when, when Saul gives this really lame answer of like, oh, I, I'm, I was going to sacrifice them to God. Right? 
And then Samuel follows up with a very famous line, to obey is better than sacrifice. Obedience is what God desires. And so Samuel instead, Samuel is this old man. He picks up a sword, he kills Agag himself. Right? Samuel's no joke. But regardless, what happens is, this was actually the action that really ended Saul's kingdom in the eyes of God. From this point on, God rejects Saul. Samuel has no more relationship with Saul, and then later David is anointed. This is essentially the end of Saul's reign, as far as we know. Again. Now remember, if, I, if you remember what I talked about last week, Mordecai is from the line of Kish. Kish is actually the father of Saul. So, so Mordecai is actually part of a similar bloodline to King Saul. And here he has a similar situation where he is confronted with an enemy from a long time ago. And the Amalekites. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about the Amalekites. Now the Amalekites, even them, they go back even further. So they actually come from the line of Esau. Right? So Jacob and Esau, these two brothers, right? the world's worst set of brothers, hate each other. Right? One's this like athletic hunter, right? who's all hairy. And the other guy is like very smooth skin, likes to cook at home. Right? So you have these two opposite guys. They hate each other. And then the, the, the smooth skin, the, you know, good cook, he swindles the other brother and steals his inter inheritance and birthright. Right? Totally messes him up. And then runs away. And, and the, there's this, this generation of hatred between these two brothers. Granted, they do get reconciled later, but there's this hatred for, for decades between them. Amalek comes from the line of Esau. I think it's uh, the concubine of his grandson or something like that. And so he comes from that line, and the Amalekites, they do grow to be this tribe. So when Israel actually comes out of Egypt, after 400 years of slavery, when they're wandering in the desert, the first group of people that attacked them were the Amalekites. And so when you look at the Old Testament, the Amalekites are always seen as like a mortal enemy because they kept attacking them while they were in the desert. And so whenever you see Amalek or Amalekite, basically that's a representation of evil in the eyes of, of the Israelites. Later on, they show up again in the book of Judges where, where Gideon, uh, like, you know, they're, they're attacking them and Gideon is the judge that's able to, to rescue Israel from them. Saul, when he goes out and he tries to wipe them out, he's actually very unsuccessful. And you even see in the book of Deuteronomy, and this is just one case where it says, you shall not, or you shall blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Now, let's fast forward. These are the top three people probably most hated by Jews in history. Um, now, some of these go without explanation. The first is Haman, right? Haman is the first person ever in the history to say, you know what, I want to kill every single Jew that lives. That's apartheid. That's the word that I put in the beginning. He is trying to wipe out an entire race. That's Haman. Antiochus Epiphanes, if you guys remember last year when I was going through the book of Daniel, he is the, the Seleucid king that ends up killing many Jews and defiling the temple. That's what the book of Daniel talks about. He's kind of that antichrist figure in the book of Daniel. Hitler, obviously, we know very clearly who Hitler is and what he did. Um, but actually, going back, this chapter talked about Pur, right? Casting of the lot. And Purim is the holiday that we will understand that the book of Esther is kind of representing. It is the day that, that honors when, when, when Israel was meant to be doomed, history reversed itself and they were set free because of Esther. And so it's a holiday that every Jew celebrates. Hitler knew this. Hitler knows the Bible. He knew the Bible very well. And so what he did was, on, on Purim, he said no Jew can celebrate Purim because he knew what it represented. And because he knew it so well, he would do things crazy on Purim. He would like, execute like 100 doctors on, on the day of Purim to kind of show that he knew what was going on. He's like, you guys defeated like 75,000 Persians. I will take it out on you right now. These are the three people in history that have done the worst things to the Jewish race. So much so, that um, when, when it talks about blotting out the name of Amalek, these are noisemakers. Okay, this one says Happy Purim. You see that? Happy Purim. So basically, on the day of Purim, there are two readings of the book of Esther. There's one in the morning, and there's one in the evening. And they read it in the synagogue. Every time they say the word Haman, 
They start making noise. So you're blotting out his name. His name doesn't exist. Or you're like, you're like, ah, like. So basically, like, the word, every time when the when they're reading scripture and it's getting to the word Haman, they make all sorts of noise so you can't hear the name. It's kind of funny. I want to actually want to witness this. Um, and I'm kind of curious, like, like if you like if you go up to a Jew and you're like, Haman. <laughs> they pull out a noise maker. <laughs> like, uh, it's kind of funny, right? Like. This is the, something they still practice today. Blotting out the name of this man. Now all this said, this is I'm just giving you the background, the explanation of why there's so much hatred between Mordecai and Haman. So much so that Haman wanted to wipe out all Jews. But what this shows me is that sin, when it grows, it grows exponentially. And over the generations, it, it gets to a point where it goes to apartheid, where people actually desire to wipe each other out. Because when you really think about it, this, this conflict started all the way back in Jacob and Esau. Right? Two brothers that couldn't get along. Two brothers that hated each other. So when, when, when Jesus talks about hatred, and he says in the Sermon on the Mount that if you hate a brother, it is the same as murdering them. For some of us, we're like, oh, Jesus, you're going too far. But if you actually understand what, what happens with sin, that's the truth. Hatred between Jacob and Esau, and you could even make the argument, it goes even further back to Cain and Abel, right? Hatred between two people, when it's left unchecked, it just grows and grows and grows. It grew to create this people called the Amalekites, who ended up being the, the source of all strife and, and evil to the Jews throughout the generations. So what this tells me, brothers and sisters, is that the things that we do and the things that we don't do, it doesn't just affect us. It affects all the generations after us. It's what we understand as generational sin. And so to me, this is one of the things that I take back from the story is that this anger, this hatred that, that comes where Haman wants to wipe out every Jew, it started many, many generations before. it could have been stopped. So what I want to remind us today is, for us, when it comes to sin, we only think about sin in our context, right? Or that, oh, you know, it, it only hurts me, right? Or it's just me doing the sin, I'm not affecting other people. But the reality of this is, is that the sin that we harbor, when it's left unchecked and it continues to grow and fester, it will definitely affect the generation. That makes you think differently. If you understand that the sin in your life will actually affect not just yourself, but your children and your children's children and their children, that changes your understanding. Like, wow, sin is no joke. It will, it's like that, that, that drop in the water that grows and grows and becomes a tidal wave. That's what sin can become when it's left unchecked. Now, as I said before, the sad thing is, is that this could have easily been stopped if King Xerxes was just like, hey, you're going overboard. I'm not going to let a people group get wiped out. That doesn't make any sense. You need to explain why you want to do this. He had the power and ability to stop this from even happening. And he did it. And so what that tells me is, as I shared before, when we were talking about authority, we also have an understanding that, you know what, as people, we need to pray for those that are in authority. Because if, if godly wisdom is instilled upon them, they can help stop things from getting even worse than they get. Right? Now, like, honestly, like, if you just look at the news, like Britain leaving the EU, I, don't, I still don't understand what this all means. Honestly, I haven't really been keeping up, but I'm like, that's kind of crazy. Right? When you're talking about like, the ripple effect that this will create in the entire world, I don't know. I don't, I don't know all the motivation behind it, but that's a very significant thing. And, and, you know, even myself as an American, it still pains me the fact that, you know, we're stuck with Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Like, like honestly, that, that really bothers me, that that's all we got. But, you know, we need to be praying for them. We need to be praying for the leaders of our countries, because in many ways, they can... They have the power to stop certain things from happening. 
or to make godly decisions, even if they aren't believers. And so these are the two things that, that God kind of really just highlighted to me was understanding sin is no joke. When it's left unchecked and it grows, this is what can happen. And at the same time, God puts these people in authority. We need to pray for them. We need to pray that godly wisdom will come upon them. But even at the end of the day, chapter 3 is kind of like the doomsday chapter. You're like, oh man, these people are going to get wiped out in a couple months, right? This is crazy. But even then, what we see is that God already had a plan. And it's going to unfold in the next chapters. And as, as crazy as this story is, and as, as, as difficult as the situation was, God still had it all under control. And we will reveal that over the next couple weeks. But that's what I want us to be reminded of, is that as, as hard of a situation as we may ever be in, we can still trust in God. It might not play out the way we want, but at the same time, He's the one in control. So I just want us to remind us of these things. Be mindful of the power of sin when it's left unchecked. Sin is not something that you can treat trivially. Pray for those that are in authority, whether it's it's your nation, whether it's your job, whether it's your company, whatever it might be, pray for those in authority. But at the end of the day, trust in God. Let's take some time to pray. Go ahead and close. I just want to take a moment for us to just be real with ourselves and to look in our lives and, and if there are sins that we have kind of just put to the side that we, you know, we're like, God, it's not that big of a deal. It's something that I'll take care of later. I want you to just take a moment to meditate that God would reveal things in your life, sins in your life that you can address right now and that He can empower you through the blood of Christ to conquer and overcome these struggles. So I just want to take a moment to just pray and say, God, reveal the things in my heart, the, the sins in my life that you desire me to resolve right now. Let's pray.
out your love onto us, Lord. And to encourage us, Lord. And to remind us, Lord, that, that sin is not something to be taken lightly, Lord. That what started as, as, as enmity between two brothers grew into this struggle of generations between two people groups, Lord, that wanted to kill each other. trust in you, that we would know, Lord, that, that no matter what circumstance we're under, there's nothing too difficult for you. And I pray, Lord, that, that as we grow in this trust, Lord, that, that we would understand that the different levels of authority above us are people that you put in charge. And so rather than, than seeking to, to, to discredit them or, or to do any of those things, Lord, that we would just trust in you. And that at the end of the day, Lord, that we would choose obedience. So help us, Lord. Encourage us, Lord, to be obedient children. 